Hello and welcome to this very special virtual Brighton Immersive Meetup. Uh, this is a little bit different. Uh, as you may have noticed, many events locally have been cancelled uh, over the past few weeks. So we thought it, if any meetup was going to survive going virtual, it would certainly have to be this one. Uh, unfortunately, as you may have noticed, I can't, I can't actually be in, I can't actually be in VR today. Um, as I'm also streaming the event to YouTube. So just be aware that if you are talking to people um, until the very end of the event where I will uh, turn off the sound for everyone, uh, you can be heard by uh, the live stream, just to bear that in mind. Um, hopefully this avatar is a little bit uh, reminiscent of me, so I'm there a little bit in spirit. Uh, now, we did have three talks planned for this evening. Uh, however, unfortunately, Samantha Kingston, uh, who was going to be talking about her 360 film Anonymous, is currently uh, in bed with a fever, uh, so of course we wish her all the best and a swift recovery. Um, at, this, at this moment in time, that's completely an understandable situation. Um, yeah, oh yeah, we can do... There we go. Uh, she has also uh, sent through a pre-recorded uh, video of her talk, which she's uh, done in the past, so I will share that out in an email after the event so everyone uh, has access to it. So tonight uh, we're going to have uh, two talks. We're going to be hearing from Sam Watts from Make Real, who will be talking about a number of their recent VR for Good projects, as you can see up on the slides here. Uh, and we're also going to be hearing from some of the System Change Hive team. So I think it's uh, Elia, Alex, and Cliff will be joining us. Uh, Kate is currently stuck with internet problems, but hopefully she can hear us through the live stream. Um, and they're going to be joining us uh, to talk about working with virtual reality for their Hidden Pass exhibition as part of the Hive project. Uh, now, apologies if the event is a little bit shorter than expected, but after the uh, talks are finished, I'm going to leave everything running, so feel free to come on and have a chat and hang around with each other while you can. Uh, and please enjoy the show. So, Sam, you are up first. Oh, there we go. Amplify my voice. Can everybody hear me okay? I see some hands. Yeah, uh, I just need to unlock my phone so I can control my slide deck. Uh, right. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. No, no microphone. All right. There we go. Uh, so, my name's Sam Watts, as you know, many of you know, um, and we're actually going to be talking about some stuff that we've done with local charities in the Brighton and Hove area uh, today, rather than uh, the more commercial work. Uh, hopefully, I can see my phone. Hang on, sorry. And we'll get the first, there we go. Um, the good old headshots. Um, I'm using slides.com, so I can't get rid of that face in the corner. Um, hopefully it's not actually then gonna overlay any of my text. Um, but I'm going to talk today about two projects that we did over the past couple of years, um, working with a local charity called Stay Up Late um, and another charity, Blind Veterans UK. Uh, and Matt is also in the audience who works for Blind Veterans. Give us a wave, Matt. Um, and he'll be able to talk more about what they're actually doing with VR beyond uh, what uh, the sort of tech days were that I got involved with. No, that counts, no. So Stay Up Late um, is a charity for people with learning disabilities. Um, and it's uh, run in a sort of very punk rock, make some noise kind of style. Um, you may have heard of them or been aware of them. Um, the sort of main onus is um, uh, raising awareness of people with learning disabilities, you know, treating them uh, as adults, um, because many of them are, um, and that, you know, it's all about staying up late and going out and having a good time and going to venues, uh, going to gigs and performances and shows, uh, just like, uh, you know, sort of every human being ever wants to. So uh, there's a lot of sort of, um, sort of people get treated with learning disabilities get treated uh, like children, you know, sort of they have to go home early, 
um, getting coverage for um, transport and ensuring that they can uh, get to and from the venue. Um, so they also have a system called Gig Buddies, uh, which um, well, uh, which also has uh, this sort of pairing system. So uh, they have a gig buddy who will go to shows with them and just make sure that they're uh, generally okay, but at the same time, an actual friend to sort of go out and socialise with. Um, that's going to be annoying if I have to do that every time. Um, so. What, uh, I actually met Paul, who runs Stay Up Late, at one of the Brighton Immersive um, uh, 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 events uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and he approached me with an idea of filming venues in 360 degrees to view back in VR to see whether that would help people feel more confident about going to a venue. Um, so the main idea was uh, we'd film a venue. Uh, it would allow people to explore that venue and feel, get a sense of presence of, of what it's like to attend the venue, also the layout. Um, but he wanted to, you know, uh, he approached me initially to sort of help him with sort of writing funding documents so that he could uh, hopefully um, get a, a small amount of money to buy some equipment and do some trial runs. Um, and then also, you know, which venues were actually uh, willing to to allow us to go and film in. Unfortunately, um, even though we were only asking for um, a small amount of money in the grander scheme of things, um, uh, we, uh, many of the funding bids were were rejected. Um, and you know we are talking like three figures here, a couple of hundred quid just for like a Gear Three Hundred and Sixty camera. Um, uh, but he, we, we weren't able to get any money for it, so um, we decided that as part of our make real sort of VR for good and sort of charity sort of uh, percentage of, of work that we can do each year, uh, that we would go and uh, support him with some of our own equipment and, and our time. So we had a workshop with a number of the members, um, and we highlighted, uh, well, the members highlighted a number of venues that they wanted to go and film. And they thought would be useful for others to see inside. Um, and then we set about doing some test filming. And then just at the last minute, um, I read about the Google Daydream Impact program, uh, where you could apply for access to a Google Jump camera, uh, which is this beast, uh, uh, which arrived in the studio just in time. And there's 16 GoPros strapped together um, uh, called a, 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 an Odyssey rig, um, and they're all networked together to sync. Um, and we ended up lugging this around um, to film the venues in. And I think it creates something like a 15k uh, video, um, which then it gets stitched together and uploaded to the Google Cloud. Uh, the jump assembler stitches all the 16 camera output together and then sends you a massive file back. Um, a couple of years ago, 16K was very impressive for a 360 camera. Since then, we've got things like the Insta Pro 2 and the Insta Titan, which do similar uh, uh, resolutions for uh, a much smaller setup. Um, so we we um, decided to go along and film the each venue. What we wanted to do was film empty shots. Um, you know, our experience of putting people into VR, people need time to acclimatise, who aren't used to it. Uh, so we, we filmed a number of, of empty shots so people just get a sense of what it felt like, what the space felt like, what the layout was, so um, you know, where the exit are, where the toilet are, um, where the stage is, where the bar is, importantly, um, and sort of how to navigate around the building. And then we filmed later on uh, a, a, a live version um, with all the audio and all the ambiance and all the actual sort of sensation of being there. And um, it was, it's, we, we did a number of venues, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, but just like lots of little things happened along the way. So this is uh, another Sam um, in the foreground there, uh, one of the members. Um, he's a big gamer. He went 
he wanted to go and film down at um, what is now called Loading Bar, which was Seaside Quest at the time. And it just happened to be Develop uh, Brighton, which is the big uh, annual game developers conference. Um, and Imre, who runs Osa Studios, um, I spotted him and I asked, I asked Sam previously, uh, what's his favorite game? And he said, Surgeon Simulator. So um, I asked Imre if he'd mind coming over just to say hello to Sam and uh, speak to him about working in the games industry. Um, and I thought, you know, he's a busy man, uh, but he actually ended up, uh, they ended up chatting for about half an hour. And, um, you know, Sam was absolutely made up um, as a result and he sort of highlights it as sort of a key moment. Um, and then also, um, filming in the Comedia, um, Chris, who was one of the one of the other members, who if you actually go and watch the films, I'll put the link up in a bit. Um, he is a real comedian and a real character, and actually getting to stand up and be on stage at the uh, at the Comedia and sort of do like a comedy uh, uh, slot, you know, really sort of gave him a lot of, uh, 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 sort of great great times. Uh, and then right towards the end, um, because it was a Google Daydream project, Google actually then reached out and they wanted to come and film a documentary about it. Um, so they followed one of the uh, one of the members and filmed like a day in the life uh, documentary about the experience of him. Um, uh, actually, he lives in Lewis, so he, they went around Lewis, um, and then him watching uh, the 360 video. Um, they filmed us filming the video. Um, and then sort of through the, the, the magic of, of film editing, that film that we'd just shot was then magically on the headset. Um, and then through him watching, they then followed him to an event and sort of how he actually benefited from, from watching the video and knowing more about the venue and sort of having his, his reservations calmed as a result. Unfortunately, shortly after that, uh, Google fell, in, fell out of love with uh, Daydream um, and VR support, um, having removed it from their Pixel phones. So the documentary is lying on a edit floor somewhere, um, and we've never actually ever seen it, and I can't actually get it out of them. So yeah, it's quite sad to sort of have all this effort just sat there, not actually being seen anywhere. So uh, um, you can get the outcomes. So you know, there's six videos in, in total. We only had a set time of uh, with the camera, um, but there's six 360-degree uh, films. They're not actually, you know, the most. They're not the most interesting films to watch because they are just of a location. Um, but the purpose is is that it gets you gives you a sense of what it's like to go to the venue. Um, and we've seen, you know, we've had feedback from other people. It's not just the the stay up late. Um, members, it's um, uh, people with, with many other sort of neurodiverse um, uh, 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 um, psychologies as well. So um, it has benefited, you know, a huge number of people. So uh, there's two um, links there. You've got the 360 YouTube videos, and you've also got the uh, 360 Google Poly um, uploads, which have additional information in them as well. And then, um, oh, so just a couple of shots. So we managed to do the dome, um, Brighton Centre. Uh, we are unfortunately weren't allowed to actually film the live show at Brighton Centre. Um, it was League of Gentlemen live, so we were able to film the audience filling up, but then we had to turn the camera off. Uh, the Comedia, um, which, uh, again, we sort of took sort of advantage of, sort of trying to do a bit of storytelling. We've got Chris um, buying tickets and behind the mixing booth and a few other shots that you wouldn't normally be able to get to. Uh, the old market is actually where we started. Um, and uh, there was a, a comedy, a, a Finnish comedy opera <coughs> being shown at the time. Um, so I removed myself from the audience at that point. Um, and then lastly, uh, the Concord Two, which was the uh, BIM Musical uh, uh, College, uh, their sort of Battle of the Bands night when we were filming. 
And oh, and sorry, and side quest. So on to the other one, which is blind veterans. Um, I think it was at, also at a uh, VR Brighton Brighton immersive meetup that Matt approached us to um, come along and do a talk at the Blind Veterans uh, Tech Week um, a couple of years ago, and um, uh, bring along some gear and do a little presentation about VR. Um, you know, veterans in the, you know ex service personnel. A lot of them were very technical. A lot of them have worked on uh, military simulators, and they've sort of seen the the the, the, the forefathers of, of the equipment of what we're all using today. So many of them had an interest in it. Um, and also sort of take along some headsets and do a demonstration. Now, of course, my first thought, like most people, was, why put blind people in VR? I mean, there's obviously, there's many things that don't make a lot of sense in that particular sentence. Um, but, you know, we went through with it and in curiosity um, had to be sort of fulfilled. Um, so to start off with, we had the Vive, um, which, uh, as many of you know, is a tethered headset. Um, had to lug a big PC up, um, and I thought that the blue, the whale experience, would be the most suitable uh, one to do because it's short. Um, you can control it. You can manage it. Um, it can be done seated. Uh, there's minimal interaction, so people didn't need to worry about controllers. Um, it gives you a good sense of awe and the scale. Um, it's you know audio, it's visual as well as audio, um, and uh, you know it gives you that sort of wow moment at the end with uh, with, with the whale. Um, and so after doing my talk, um, we, we we sort of asked the first willing volunteer to come up and try it and didn't know at all at that point how, what was going to happen. Um, but yeah, we sort of have to bear in mind that whilst it's blind veterans, you know, they have a degree of, of, of uh, partial sightedness all the way through to full blindness. But the shocking thing was, is that most people, or, or many of them, um, actually, uh, you know, they could actually see better in VR than what they could do uh, in the real world. Uh, unfortunately, my face is covering the disclaimer there that, you know, it's not a guaranteed 100% success rate, um, which, you know, we made it very clear to the, to the members that, um, you know, to, to be prepared to uh, still not be able to experience what somebody else uh, has experienced in terms of the clarity. But, you know, it's more kind of like, why, is, why does it work? Uh, somebody who has to be guided over in the real world to a chair uh, with sticks um, and sort of told where the chair is so they can sit down, um, you know, much like you or I do when we're wearing a headset and we're standing and trying to find a seat um, uh, uh, in the real world. Um, suddenly putting a headset on them, they were up and around chasing fish about from the smallest ones to, you know, being able to come poke the, the, the whale in the eye. It was amazing. Um, and it's the, you know, it, it's, it's been the most memorable, moving, sort of valid use of VR and sort of demo that I've ever done. Uh, so some of the things I think why it works um, is down to uh, the, sort of the proximity of the screen to uh, the user's eyes, um, rather than, um, uh, it's not like um, uh, uh, when our parents used to tell us for sitting too close to the TV when we were younger, um, when you're in VR, your eyes focus at infinity, so you look through the screen rather than at the actual um, uh, physical plane. Um, and then with the brightness and the contrast of the screen combined with the magnification of the lenses, uh, it seems to help sort of combat and work around some of the uh, sort of visual impairment uh, issues that, that, that some of the members had. As I say, it didn't work for everyone. Some didn't get it, didn't. A, a single thing or didn't have any sort of real improvement um, but due to the sort of binaural and um, uh, the, 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 the 360 surround audio they still have got a sense of immersion and presence uh, by just having a headset and the headphones on they, they could tell where they were and they could follow tr and track uh, fish around them um, so I went back 
um, uh, for, for their second tech week. And uh, by then we had the Vive Pro and uh, the wireless headset. Uh, so you know, one of the health and safety risks had been removed is in the tether and the cable um, and the, the massive trip hazard. Um, and we did a blue again, but then uh, after losing focus uh, for and being um, in competition with tea and biscuits, uh, we came back for some uh, tilt brush. And uh, Ken came up um, to have a go at tilt brush and ended up drawing this amazing scene of Mickey Mouse playing uh, uh, in a sort of garden of flowers. Um, unfortunately, my mug there is covering up the bitty link that I did then I put up uh, that links to the Blind Veterans UK story uh, about Ken because uh, he's quite a character. Um, but it's uh, uh, BV UK Ken, uh, which is a bitly link, um, which you can go and watch the, the video. And then recently we went back again with the Oculus Quest. Uh, so no more tethers, um, no more PCs, no more extra equipment. Um, just being able to put headsets on people and get straight in, straight on uh, uh, with VR. Um, and unfortunately, I felt like a bit of a Tupperware salesman because everyone wanted to buy them straight away, but uh, I'm not an official uh, reseller of Oculus hardware, so I was unable to do so. Um, but it just goes to show that even over a couple of years, the advancing technology uh, has sort of vastly improved usability for, for all kinds of users. Um, my concerns now is to move forward with eye tracking and more headsets that start to replicate uh, how how uh, eyes work and sort of more in the real world. Are these elements that allow VR to work for people now? Is that are they going to fade away? Um, and then are, are the, the the veteran members actually going to struggle with with VR moving forward? So Matt has gone out and got a, a number of units of you know headsets we know work today. Um, and then finally, sort of, um, you can ask Matt afterwards about in terms of what they're doing with VR, but they have a number of Vives and Quests set up. Um, I've been reaching out to uh, Dark Dan, who runs, oops, got my mic, you can still hear me probably. Um, Dark Dan, who runs Big Screen, owns Big Screen, um, to look at how members could use Big Screen to have a PC desktop streaming live TV and a sort of iMac at a person cinema. Maybe. There we go. There we go. It's alright, I've been finished. I've been talking so long it's gone dark in my room and I've lost all tracking on the quest. <laughs> and the mic. Um, but the idea being that each, each member can then have their own personal cinema uh, with headphones on and watch TV uh, at large scale for their own choice. Um, and you know, they are veterans as well, so um, hearing loss is another issue. And as we know, with grandma listening to TV, uh, many people in the same room, uh, headphones uh, or bliss for all. So I think if I can get back to my phone, that's pretty much it. Um, I'll be around a little bit after this, um, and uh, oh, we're online. Um, working remotely, uh, and there's many things I've talked about at that um, link there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. I've actually unmuted everyone so they can say thank you in person. Thank you. Talking? There we go, yeah. Thank you. Nice yeah. one, Sam. Thank you.
Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going to uh, hold for a couple of minutes while I get the next talk set up. So I'm going to leave the mics unmuted so you can all talk. Uh, but just please bear in mind that this is live on YouTube. <laughs> Good morning. Alex, where are you? Down here. Wave. Oh, there you are. Hi. Whoa. Hi, Matt. Are you talking now? <laughs> yes, I think so, if all goes to plan. Great. How are you doing? Nice outfit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. It's happening. Where's Elia? Oh, there you are. Um, so I'm going to have to say a few words first, uh, as um, Kate can't be here tonight, so she's asked me to sort of introduce everything on her behalf. So I will do that now. I'm just going to put everyone on to mute now. Just a heads up. Okay. Uh, so. What Kate wants me to say is, uh, the System Change Hive is a community art collective set up by Swarm Dynamics, dedicated to sharing knowledge about the futures based on well-being and systems change. They created the exhibition Hidden Paths for the ONCA Gallery in Brighton, and the group is made up of emerging and established artists working with researchers, communications experts, VR technologists, and local community groups. Working with Andy Baker, who is here tonight, Andy, do you want to wave? Uh, yeah, there we go, he's at the back. Uh, working with Andy Baker at the Fuse Box in Wired Sussex, uh, they created a virtual museum to reveal hidden paths to brighter, fairer and more sustainable futures. A group of artists created a spacious world of colour and poetry together and recorded real-world activists speaking about the future that they wanted to see. Uh, we are reflecting together in the serious time of planetary pandemic that our experiment with creating a virtual space for solidarity, reflection and support of radical alternatives is now much needed. The world of immersive technology is really called to look to uh, fulfilling the promise of social VR in this serious time of self-isolation. Today, Ilya, Alex and Cliff join us from uh, System Change Hive Collective to share about the project and have a conversation about what was learned. The process we used at System Change Hive involved dialogue and listening to multiple perspectives. So today we're excited to have a conversation together in virtual space tonight around the potentials of virtual reality for supporting community, solidarity and societal transformations. Oh, that was, that was a tongue <laughs> Okay. Uh, if the Hive guys want to come up now, that'd be great. Where is everybody? Hey, I forgot how to play the box, so I'm just going to be talking. <laughs> Hey, come on down. If you go to your host screen, can you click on the button to turn my voice off? Yeah. There we go. Where's Cliff? I don't know. <laughs> we might have to start with that and see, see where, he, where he's going. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure where Cliff has gone, but um, yeah, essentially the system changed high. It brought together artists, uh, researchers, academics, um, and technologists all together to sort of learn about system change overall um, and just try and think of creative pathways, um, creative solutions um, to the issues that we face. 
Um, it culminated in an exhibition at the, the Onca, and um, obviously there's our digital centerpiece in, in VR, um, the museum space, uh, but we also had um, an exhibition which we call an analogue exhibition as well, so sort of around that with a lot of our thinking and creative ideas. So it is meant to be going on tour at the moment, um, but obviously a lot of it's been cancelled or postponed um, due to the, the pandemic. Um, although we are actually speaking, um, doing a workshop at the Schumacher College next week, which has been revived online, interestingly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, system change. Uh, we had like a million lectures uh, before we, we kind of got going with the creative, so it was a lot of, um, a lot of thinking and sharing ideas and things like this. Um, is Cliff coming? I don't know. Should we just go ahead, just us? Yeah. Yeah. I can explain a little bit what it was like. Basically, we, we yeah. made a museum, um, a museum of like the future, and in that museum there was lots of objects that um, that belong to like the present world that we 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 wish wouldn't exist in the future, sort of thing. Um, so I think we talked a lot about like uh, industrial pr uh, production of like clothing, um, like money in general as like a concept. Um, kind of like brainless addictions to, to like, well not addictions, just like the way some people use technology in a way that isn't really like critical, for example. Um, I forgot what the rest of the objects were, but there was like a few objects like this inside. Of, it wasn't interactive or anything. It was, it was kind of like a passive experience. Um, and then it kind of walked into a, another, where you, you were like on a, you were on a, on a rail track we went to the museum on a rail track and you could see these glass boxes with the objects inside and then we, we arrived in another room uh, which had like more of the, the kind of process that we went through as a collective of, of artists um, and, and, the, uh, and the work that other people had done that were in the analog kind of like paintings and photography and things like this that were put into the inside the, the museum that were kind of like testimonies of of kind of the research and the exploration of these themes that we that we looked at throughout, like we had lots of like anthropologists and economists coming to talk to us um, all those lovers. Um, yeah, and then there was an audio. Uh, there was quite a lot going on. There was also like an audio track with voices of three different activists that uh, me and Kate contacted that all worked in environmental activism all around the world, and we had them. Um, we had them writing down a little, like, kind of poetic, poetic prose um, of what they they want to see accomplished in the world. And so we had some of them working with um, with rights of water, um, kind of get getting legal rights for water. We had someone working with uh, community building around trans uh, activism, uh, like an anarchism, I suppose. And then there was a, a woman working from, um, which, yeah, I don't really know how to explain this. Kate would be better at it, but we had like three women, uh, and there were voices in the, in the museum. So, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Do you have anything else to say, Kate? It might be a good idea. I'm going to unmute the mic and I'll let people ask some questions as well. Great, right, yeah. Have questions for each other as well. I should add as well that we, we uh, because uh, Kate was the one who created the no, I'm fine. Because Kate was the one who created the slides, uh, we can't actually advance past the first slide at the minute. So um, oh, no. this is just what we're going to be looking at at the minute. <laughs> just because okay. people have asked. Uh, but yeah, if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, I'm going to uh, um, open the microphones up now and let people ask. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, Mr. P.
I see a hand up. Nope. What you want to do is enable raise hands. <laughs> there we go. Ah. If you want to ask a question, click on raise hand and then Chris will be able to take your phone away. Oh, there we go. So? Oh, definitely one. Oh, Cliff's there. <laughs> oh, I think I've all unmuted myself finally. I've got a question. Um, Dean, is there a place um, on where we could see some work virtually? I mean, that we could visit in our own time or? There are trailers on online, um, and we can share that with everyone. Um, yeah, um, obviously the best way is to experience it, um, but with with the current issues, it's not going to be possible. But yeah, the next tour dates are are postponed. But yeah, we can definitely share the the trailers. There's a few different ones, and just to give you a feel of everything, for sure. Great. Thanks. Oh, so what was that? You had a hand raised. <laughs> you know, I, was, that was, I was probably just clicking on things to see what they did. <laughs> I mean, I, I've got some questions I can ask, and um, we've both got some questions for each other. If, um, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's, let's get on with it, Alex. Yeah. So, so Elia. Um, no, I should, actually, I should ask you questions first because that was the way like, Kate put it around. Okay, let's, let's go back to the yeah. plan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, go, go, go. So, Alex, um, I'm going to get you to. Broke? Yeah. Amplify. Oh. Cool. There we go. Yes. Awesome. Um... <laughs> So Alex, uh, I was, uh, um, I, can you tell us uh, about the experience at the Hive in general and what it was like to use virtual reality as a tool to consider ideas around systems change? And maybe you can give like a quick description of what systems change mean because it's a bit complex. So yeah, let's start off with, with that as it's pretty important. Um, so obviously to tackle the issues we have around climate change, um, it's required to sort of change the systems around it um, because ultimately that's what the problem is. So that's what we sort of went into great detail in, in the system change hive um, and just learning about the current models and then also different models of, of living that are already in place around the world. So things like the gift society where people become richer the more that they give and how might that change society in in the west um if you know rather than just hoarding all of your money like the you know the richest people in the world if if you were rich by the amount that you gave how would that affect homelessness for example so we we discovered all of these you know amazing different ways of living that are already happening um but it was also quite frustrating as well and a bit traumatic to learn about all these these different ways but there's no one sort of um, solution for mass society and it's almost impossible for one one group to to sort of dictate this is the one solution that fits all um, so I think that's what's really interesting about the this project and the VR is it's that taking what we've learned taking this exploratory space to the public for them to then experience what we did 
and to just have that space, that freedom to imagine how things could be different. Um, so that's, I'm, I was lucky enough to take the, the, the experience to Warwick Change Festival um, and just getting members of the public to, to experience it. And I think, you know, what, what comes out of that, that next stage, that's what's going to be really interesting and where we might come up with, you know, the real solutions collectively. <laughs> What was my next question, Elia? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I wasn't laughing at you. I was laughing because, like, I was watching like the one of the one of the people was standing up and they were like what, looking from the window. Concentrate. All right. Um, sorry, that's my question. Yeah, no, it was really challenging. It was really interesting. Um, so, and how does this um no i'm just gonna go on with the, the second question i have for you um because kate did these because kate was gonna ask us questions and she had in mind like the structure so <laughs> there was a structure there really was <laughs> there was a structure <laughs> so uh how did the experience develop your awareness of vr for kids yeah, it really opened up my eyes. Um, I've been studying at, at Brighton, doing a master's in, in digital media arts. Um, and in the beginning, I, I wasn't really that into to VR. But then through, through doing the System Hive project, I've, I've realized you know, what a powerful tool it is. And, and now it's really become, you know, it's, it's taken over for me. Um, my dissertation is about the potential of immersive technologies to create positive change. Uh, so in terms of wellness, um, happiness, um, so, you know, with the rise of positive psychology and, and neuroscience, you know, we have a real wealth of knowledge now as a foundation for games designers um, and to create experiences that have real sort of positive physiological effects. So, you know, whether it is creating connection or, or just having fun, um, it's an extremely powerful tool, um, you know, even, you know, to to help heal the collective trauma we're facing in terms of, of um, you know, our current situation. Um, you know, all the research is showing that it, it really is um, an efficient tool in terms of treating mental health problems, um, which, which I believe are side effects of our current way of living. So, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are acutely interested in this field. You know, in the future, will VR take over from taking pharmaceutical drugs in, in terms of treatments because it is more uh, efficient um, and also to, to be used as a tool to create personal change and collective change through transformational experiences. Um, so that's, um, that's what I've sort of learned from, from being in the hive and I think that will um, sort of carry me throughout my career now in, in immersive um, and VR especially. Are you ready? I'm having a meeting in VR. Ah, we've just got a couple more questions, Chris, um, for Elia. Yeah, so Elia, uh, tell us about the process of recording future testimonies with activists for the Museum of the Future, and, and why were you so excited to get Otter involved? Yeah, cool. So originally, like, uh, we were going to write the... What's that? Hello? Hey, sorry, I don't know. I got... Um, I think I muted myself. Um, uh, obviously, <laughs> how I'm nervous, uh, <laughs> just as I started to talk. So I'm just going to start again. Um, yeah, originally we were gonna have like a fiction, fiction narratives. We were gonna write, write characters that would kind of testify of this new world that we wanted to sort of like be in the future, or someone coming to talk to us from the future, sort of to be a bit like hopeful and try to make a narrative that isn't all gloomy and dark. Like a lot of the times when we think about climate change, it's like we're really powerless. Um, so we really wanted to to give a well like to have agency as like one of the main things um and i think we're like quite successful at that actually because 
it wasn't like a gloomy experience at all. Um, so yeah, and we want to write fiction, but then me, me and Kate just were like, why would we write something new if there's already so many people in the world that are literally dedicating their whole like life to try and combat like um well you know eco terrorism or you know land grab or whatever like a lot of other things that destroying your planet like I'm thinking about like fracking camps or I'm thinking about you know even like North Dakota like pipelines and all these places where people is their life to defend you know the planet and that so so I wanted to bring Otter um because throughout the project I was thinking about her book a lot so Atta is, a, is an, a writer from from Brighton actually I mean she studied ecology in um, in Sussex University and a lot of her book is inspired by like the wildlife around Brighton so there's a lot of like net, nettles and starlings and kind of like ways of relating with the world like that so I wanted to bring her because the way she thinks about the struggle around climate change she doesn't think about it like there's a before and an after, like there's a fight that's going to be won or something. It's like a struggle, like a perpetual struggle. So it's like an everyday life kind of thing. And it's not about like shopping in a more ethical way or imagining like a future where everything is green and everything is beautiful. But it's about like acknowledging the struggle and the violence that the state uh, creates um, to humans and the planet. So. So that was really important for me to kind of highlight this complexity. Um, mm. Yeah, so, and then she, um, Yeah, uh, and she, she wrote, I asked her to, so I just contacted her because I, we've been in contact before I saw her like talk about her book once in Brighton. So I, I contacted her and asked her to sort of write about it. And uh, she just wrote like a this three minute uh, vision from the future, like like looking back at her present fight. And I think I'm going to start to ramble now. So yeah. you ask me the next question. <laughs> okay. So why why trans feminist solidarity in in the digital? Okay. So that's a question that without any context means. Uh, not much. So yeah, Arta is like a <laughs> trans. <laughs> she's a trans woman, and she she um, does a lot of like community organising for trans people. Um, so what's community organising? Like she's quite an outspoken. She has like public talks, workshops. She has writing workshops. Uh, she has this collective. Um, collective of film and I think she's now based in Berlin and she has uh, she's made like a little like social center thing where they talk about um, about activism around like trans right but also like prison uh, activism and these kind of things um, so these are not like obviously directly linked to these are not linked to climate change but they're symptoms of like the same illness of the way like society is basically like treating people Mm. Um, so, so yeah, and I think like her intersections and the way she like, I don't know, I, in some way I feel like her trans identity or like is, it, it kind of enables people to see like more complexity around the world as well, you know, it's not like everything's black and white. Um, so yeah, and in the digital is because I think um, like one of the main thing that came to when we were doing systems change is like, the need for a space like we need space to be able to organize but space is like political because space is expensive and you can't you know it's very hard to just get a place <laughs> if you want to organize so this is why like it's taken a big um a big liking to online because you can outreach to as many people as possible and you know you just need to google it <laughs> and you can find ways to connect with other people and you can find other people that share the same experiences and it literally costs nothing whereas like physical space is really really difficult to get a hold of so so yeah, yeah that's 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 what i'm saying about this <laughs> great great and just this is a really interesting one you were originally skeptical about vr and you were one of the sort of main critical voices in the group sort of raising questions about the tech 
So did working as the, at the Hive sort of change your perspectives? Yeah, it's funny that uh, Kate said that because I, I, I don't remember thinking that, but I guess I was. <laughs> I remember uh, a little bit. Yeah, I think it was like skepticism is like a, a good a good word for it because um, because yeah, I probably was. Let me just find my notes. Um, oh, okay. So I think originally I was just kind of like just generally like why would we use technology in general when we want to talk about climate change because it just to me it felt a bit counterintuitive uh, because of like probably for like ethical reasons like how it's sourced you know like if you want to think about climate change you want to think about the way where things are coming from and so when you think about technology obviously you have no idea where it's actually coming from like there's no way to know how it's actually assembled so I was a little bit like, mm. <laughs> how can we like, how these contradictions, you know, how they come together. Um, but then, then that's the case for like literally everything. Like, you can't actually be that, you know. Yeah, you can't be that, that skeptical about it because literally like every other thing is like that. But then I was like, okay, every other thing is like this, but this is not like a necessity. Like you don't need VR, you know. So, well, I didn't think we did, but then I found out that actually there's like a huge community around it, which I thought was really cool. Like I went to uh, Presuming It and then I came to the fuse box and I thought just how much like it gets people together at the same time, even though it's like a tool that is experienced to learn and stuff. And then I found out you can actually experience it with other people. And also like, um, it kind of gave us a reason at, um, at uh, the exhibition to actually like dialogue with other people because when you have like an experience mm. in VR and you, you instantly just want to talk about it or you instantly want to ask someone like how it was because it's like such an intense experience that you just want to talk about it so that actually connects people as well even though yeah. it's like not an experience where you like can experience it together so I thought that was really cool yeah Totally agree, yeah. and it's been yeah. amazing watching, taking it on tour, and watching you know parents experiencing it, and then their children experiencing it. Um, you know, people on their own, people of all ages, um, and what their reactions are. And yeah, it's just amazing to see. So yeah. yeah, exactly. And like a friend of mine was telling me, like actually, she was much more open to like these new ideas when she was in VR because she was not in her she didn't have like her frame of reference that she does in, you know, if she was, if she wasn't, if she was just seeing like her own perspective. So she had like given up already that kind of like judgment or that frame of reference that you had, like there's a part of you that you give up when you, when you get, when you go in VR. And so you, she said she was mm. becoming more open to like new ideas, which, exactly. which is like kind of cool. Yeah. So, but at the same time, you don't want to be dependent on that to get any ideas. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know how we're doing for time, but um, maybe Cliff, um, did you have something prepared? Went on a little walk there. I mean, I, if someone raises their hand, are they waiting for us to, to say they can you talk? No, that sounds to me. I just can't see them in the menu. Ah, there's you can toggle mute all. I think I see like Cliff's hands going up and down. Yeah. Grab the mic. Can you get it? Really? Mic drop. <laughs> oh, mic drop. <laughs> uh, 
Uh oh. <laughs> Please come in. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Is that it? Sorry, it, it's been quite chaotic getting here. <laughs> Okay, can we all hear you now? Yes. Thumbs up? Uh, yeah, right, okay. Uh, where to start? I, I'm a, uh, uh, an art, a full-time artist. I uh, work between physical and digital media. Um, I've got a message of uh, telling me to confirm something as well. Uh, I, but last year, at the beginning of the last year, I've not done any work with VR at all. Uh, I've done 3D work with Blender and was working on a big piece for that, which I completed last year. But what struck me about VR is, as an artist, uh, you research things, uh, you listen to academic papers or read academic papers, you, you take all of this information in, uh, but ultimately what what you put out is subjective. It's, I'm not trying to say, I found the proof, this is how the world is. I'm trying to communicate how I see the world and hope to make a, an emotive connection. What struck me about VR and strikes me about VR now is the extent to which when you look, normally look at images of artwork, there's a separation between you and the image. There's a separation between you and what it's talking about. Uh, when you get in VR and you, you, you make it large, it, it's present. There's a, there's a much tighter connection. And for me, it was that connection that was important. Um, there were lots of, lots of the, the members of Systems Change Hive were producing material and had ideas and were talking about what or, or producing work that talked about their perspective on it and what I found was that moving that into VR improved that connection, improved that sense of presence not just of the artwork but of the ideas behind the artwork so uh, for me it very much became like the process of curation is when you you take you put an exhibition together and you take all of these perspectives from different artists and you you try to put it together in a way that communicates all of those views with a sense of coherence it, it comes with issues of course because you're presenting lots of different views so any one person looking at it is going to go, hopefully, well, I think that bit was really interesting, um, but I'm not quite sure why we gave the emphasis to that. Uh, but you hope it comes together uh, as a set. Um, I keep losing my headphones, so any questions about that? I think I've got there unless somebody wants to ask a question. I'm, I'm loving the hearts, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. I'm going to put the microphone down. <laughs> it's feeling quite heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's us then, Chris. Excellent. Excellent, thank you. Hearts fast. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us as well. Uh, this is it's been a very interesting event, uh, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really glad we got a chance to actually test out using a virtual platform for a meeting. Uh, and obviously we've had a few technical glitches tonight, uh, but I'm actually really excited to see how this went. So, I'm going to leave everything live now, uh, so I'm going to uh, mute the audio on the live stream, so everyone watching on the live stream, thank you very much for joining us. Um, there have been quite a number of people talking in chat, and I'm going to try and send out in an email following this all the links 
uh, to all the uh, presentations that people sent uh, and things like that. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm going to leave the uh, old space open, so please uh, <laughs> hang around and have a chat. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Hey. Thanks for so much.